So not very far away from today, uh, something like 50, 60 years ago, uh, food used to be nutritious. Food was safe, food was good for us, food was fresh. Uh, Hippocrates, the father of Western medicine, believed in the self-healing of human beings through diet and rest. And somehow, somewhere, things went a little bit wrong. Um, food became not so nutritional and very high in calories. We feed our population to f basically not give them the nutritional values they need, but to give them a comfort, to give them sometimes entertainment. So we disconnected ourselves from what really food comes from and what really food is meant to do for us. And why did this thing happen? What went wrong here? Well, it's clearly that we had to feed large masses of population. It's clearly that with the large demographic explosion, we needed methods of feeding a lot of people and very fast. So the traditional ways of processing food, like fermentation, like bottling in glasses, like curdling cheese, um, were lost, most of them. Even cheese today is really overly processed. Try North America, not Holland. Um, so what happened is that we created a way of transporting this food throughout the world in tins, in plastics, with preservatives, with additives. And things got really, really wrong, to the point of screaming. And you'll scream with me now. Did you know that even the simplest thing like honey today as acrylamide. Do you know what acrylamide is? How many people know what acrylamide is? One person, two people. It's a carcinogen. It's a cancer-provoking agent. It also is many other things, as you see there, a neurotoxin. It contributes to the toxicity of the um, brain. But fundamentally, we think we're taking honey in. And if that honey has been pasteurized, that honey likely has acrylamide. Ah, yeah, 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 too little to make an effect. No, it's not going to harm anyone. That's what we're told. But the problem is that there is no studies today showing the cumulative effect of exposure, consistent and effective exposure every day to that carcinogen. There isn't, because we can't make those studies, because we have no enough data. So you take your honey every day, and you may take it three or four times a day. Now you ask yourself, did someone put that damn acrylamide in the honey? No. Acrylamide is a byproduct of processing and pasteurizing the honey at high temperatures. Acrylamide happens to occur when starches are heated at high temperature. So it's a byproduct. No one put it there. There's no Machiavellic intention here. Join me now to look at bisphenol A, which some of you likely know what it is. We, with the tins, most of the tins that we have, we line the tins with a special re resin. The resin is bisphenol A. Bisphenol A is known to be an hormonal disruptor. What does that mean? It means that it comes into your system and the body believes that it's an hormone. In fact, the, our body believes it's an estrogen. It's a xenoestrogen, a foreign estrogen. And our body reacts to it as if it is estrogen. And so we have a disruption of our endocrinal system. Now, is this avoidable? Yes, this one is very avoidable. Just don't use tins that have resin with bisphenol A. Now, the European Commission um, has actually asked the European Food Safety to do a, sa a study on bisphenol A. That study has been published actually this month, just a few days ago, January 15th. And that study says, if you read the press release, great, bisphenol A is not dangerous to anyone, children or adults. But if you read the fine printing, you will see that it's not bad for you because the levels accepted have been reduced. How much have they been reduced? Well, last year, 50 micrograms per kilogram of body weight per day. This year, four micrograms per kilogram of body weight per day. Now, from 50 to four, we have a drastic reduction. Drastic reduction. Sure, we can say it's safe. 
I wonder when we're going to say it's safe and we're going to give it a level of 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.1 or 0. 0.0001. Wh what makes this safe when we don't have enough evidence and enough studies of the cumulative effect of these carcinogens and hormone disruptors? And the story goes on. Rice. Recently, I had a talk with the largest raw material manufacturer in Europe, from Zurich. I, and he told me, I don't use rice anymore because I'm a responsible person, and every time I test rice, I see arsenic. And I said, well, I know there is arsenic in rice. Most of us, if you do a Google, you know there is arsenic in rice. But is it really that much arsenic in that rice? Yes, he told me. Enough to upset me, enough for me not to use it. So arsenic, a natural heavy metal that exists in soil. Why are our fields in North America filled with rice? I'll tell you why. Because rice is grown mostly in the southern part of, of North America, and it's grown in places where the cotton, cotton used to be grown. And long time ago, we used pesticides that had arsenic to kill some bugs in those cotton fields. Arsenic persists on a soil. It's a heavy metal. So today we grow rice, and because we grow that rice in water, it really attracts the arsenic. So you think you're eating something good, but here it is, arsenic. It's inorganic arsenic, by the way. It has all sorts of effects. It's also a carcinogen, it affects fetal development, and so on and so on. Worse yet, try going to China. The likelihood that you have exposure to gutter oil is very high. I was in China, in Beijing, and I was sick for one week with project vomiting because I ate some asparagus that had been cooked with gutter oil. I'm certain of it because all I could sense and feel was the oil. What is gutter oil, someone asked me last night at dinner. Well, in China, oil is expensive, so a lot of people go into the gutter with their buckets, take the gutter out, go back home, clean it, repackage it, and sell it. Yes, this is possible. Are the authorities in China trying to curb this down? Yes. Now, time to scream, right? Time to really scream. What the heck is in our food? And are we astonished that we have children growing more and more allergies? In Europe alone, 17 million people suffer from food allergies. In the world, 250 million people suffer from food allergies. The culprits just mostly 90% ate foods. There's almost never you find someone that doesn't have an allergy. The reason why I'm here in this stage today is because my daughter was raised in Europe and was moved to North America at the age of 14, three years ago. And within three months of being in North America, she fell sick with food allergies. It was obvious it was an allergy because she had hives and angioedema, which is the swollen of the skin. But no one could pin down exactly why she could not walk, why a body was covered with hives, and blood pressure had dropped so much that for eight months she was bedridden. And being an entrepreneur, I thought, I've got to do something about this. It's not possible that with my knowledge of technology and my knowledge of health, I cannot help someone like my daughter. And then I discovered how many millions of people out there are suffering from not knowing what their food is. So it is a global problem, a problem that we all need to know and address. So my team and I, we have uh, basically used spectroscopy to detect at the molecular level what is in a food. Okay? And so I have here a, a, a prototype, a bit of prototype. Uh, it's a spectrometer, and I am going to scan uh, some food that I just brought in from the breakfast this morning, and my phone is going to show me um, exactly what is in that food that I'm scanning. Okay, so I'm just going to take this bread side because it's already open, and I'm throwing light at the bread. Okay, and within a few seconds, I have on my phone the information about the bread. Just a second, Let, this is clearly not going. Just a second. Okay. 
OK, now we just show it. I don't know if you cut it moving. OK, so in my phone, I have essentially uh, something that I'll show you on the screen. Um, how many calories, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, whether or not this product has gluten, if it has eggs, if it has milk, and what type of sugars. And particularly, this bread has gluten, does not have eggs, has milk, has fructose, has some glucose. The glucose is likely a byproduct of cooking with a bit of sucrose. Okay? So, let me explain what I just did. It's spectroscopy. What you see there is a scanner that we are miniaturizing this big, we call it the rat because it's so big, uh, but it's going to be one quarter of this size. So we throw light at the food, and the protons that are sent, it's just allergen light, it doesn't affect the food, are sent in a consistent way of length, hit the molecules of the food, absor the molecules of the food absorb some energy from the photons, and they reflect back. They reflect back those photons at a different way of length, depending on the molecule. That number of photons and the way of length give us a unique fingerprint of the food. That unique fingerprint of the food is sent to the phone through Bluetooth, and the phone sends it to our cloud. Our cloud happens to be in the Amazon. Uh, we have several algorithms running in our servers. They do the decomposition much the same way you do machine learning and face recognition. We do uh, machine learning for recognizing the X spectrum based on the food, and then it's sent to the consumer um, again through the cloud, to the cloud, to, through an app. What does the consumer see? The consumer sees um, carbohydrates, um, fats, uh, proteins, calories, as well as the ingredients. No, we're not doing pesticides yet, but yes, we will one day. And no, we're not doing bacteria yet, but yes, we'll do one day. No, we are very much in the beginning. We are not even in the market with the product. We're just starting to ship to the beta units, to the beta testers. So sometime, hopefully this year, we will be in the market. Uh, but the interesting part is that we don't just give the ingredients, we teach what the ingredients are. Because often we read a label and we go, maltodextrin, tartazine, what is that? And in this is a perfect example of seeing tartazine in a food. Tartazine is a yellow dye. It's used in potato chips uh, and in corn chips um, to make it yellow. It's really absolutely no nutritional value. In fact, tartazine is being associated with a lot of aggressiveness in children. So we have a, a, a wiki of ingredients and health attached to this scanner. And that's called Telspecopedia. Um, teaching people what the ingredients are and how they affect the health. That's what people will see. So what are we trying to do? We're really trying to stop screaming. We're really trying to bring a grassroots revolution for clean food. So educated consumer knows at the molecular level what the food is, understands what those ingredients do to their health. That is going to force accountability and transparency both in farm production and in manufacturing of food. No more putting a veil over our eyes. We will know when we have something that is not good for us. And what will happen is that will force in itself the backwards, going backwards to the production of food, how we keep that food safe, the traditional ways, the fermented ways, the ways that were beneficial to our health. And will force as well local farming. Okay? Why? Because the transportation issue has to be resolved. We can't transport food without putting preservatives. We don't want those additives in our food. So we will have extra uh, ways of doing it. So what I have in the near future, food scanners will be everywhere. They will be integrated in your phone. And they will give you the connection between the food source and the individual. They will also create agricultural neighborhoods as well as town farming in a sustainable way. So let me give you a picture of what's happening already through the world. You've seen already quite a bit of that today. But instead of being gardens, they are actually uh, real gardens for food. In Chicago over there, uh, I was in Guangzhou in China in 2005, and this was the inspiration. The Guangzhou roofs are full of gardens that people garden locally. Now, of course, here there is a little problem in terms of supply and demand. If one of you grows a lot of lettuce and another one grows a lot of tomatoes, what are you going to do? Because you still need transportation. 
And this is a vision, my vision, and I'm going to share with you the vision. We live in a world where we are disintegrating. Um, this, we live in a world where we are cutting the middleman. So we can use some technology to do that. So bear with me for a second. What happens here is that local food will have less foods with less additives, foods that ideally will be organic, foods that will be fresher, more fresh and healthier, more dense in nutritional value and in less in calories. They will not trigger risks. They will not associate risks of chronic diseases because we know that all the, all the common diseases that exist today in the world are associated to food. Uh, for instance, diets that don't, ha don't have vegetables and, and fruits have been associated scientifically to all sorts of diseases from diabetes to heart diseases and cancer. The next slide is my vision of how we deal with this using technology. How many of you have, uh, understand crowdfunding? Crowdfunding? Now, let's do crowdfunding with agriculture, local agriculture. This group here has produced too many lettuce, and that group over there has produced too many potatoes. Let's exchange them. Let's use a new, tech, a new economy, a hybrid economy, okay? Where people are basically farming locally and sharing online on the marketplace the extra. So, it's basically the disintermediation of food supply and demand. And it's so simple. It's just a question of licensing the online marketplace. Little cities can do that. They can be a source of income for the cities. The Kickstarters and the Indiegogos of the world, they make 4% of what is raised. Cities could be making a little bit of money to bring the community together online. So using technology, I don't want to give a message that technology is really detrimental, that because we wanted to farm so much and we wanted to feed so many people, we went astray. Yes, we did went astray, but we can fix it, and we can fix it through technology. So I welcome you to a clean food revolution and a revolution where we know, all of us, what we eat and what's in our food. Thank you.